Well, good afternoon. Such a quiet and attentive group. <laughs> Either that or you're just plain exhausted after what I'm sure has been a long day. But we intend to keep you uh, very much interested in the panel that's about to kick off. Uh, I'm Francis Collins. I'm the director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And it's my privilege to serve as the moderator of this panel on shaping the future of health uh, with a very distinguished group of five panelists. This is part of the global challenge on the future of health, which is a theme of the 2016 World Economic Forum with, I think, no less than 35 dialogues uh, focused on health, more than I think has ever happened in Davos. And I've been coming to this meeting for almost 20 years. Uh, so it's wonderful to see this kind of focus. And uh, this is a session where we're going to particularly look at the future of health as it relates to what we're going to do about the 9.7 billion people that we estimate will be living on this planet in 2050. Are we ready for that uh, in terms of the health concerns? Uh, only 20% of health outcomes depend on the healthcare sector. Most of the rest uh, depend on the environment, on individual choices, on public policies. And we particularly want to focus in this session on what we could do collectively across many different sectors in order to improve the likelihood that more of those 9.7 billion people will be able to leave full lives not cut down by disease. Uh, and that means we're going to be talking about health promotion and disease prevention and what things could be done in order to maximize that. Now, some might say, well, all we have to do is give people the information about what it is that promotes health and everything will be fine. I don't think this audience is naive enough to think that that's the answer. I wish that we could say that all of us and all of those other people are rational actors in every space. Uh, we know that doesn't necessarily apply. And even in circumstances where resources are actually fairly plentiful, people make bad decisions about their health. And while we don't want to turn into big brothers or nanny states, we do want to come up with ways to encourage health decisions to be the easy decision and not the hard one. And that's one of the things we might be talking about in the course of this uh, conversation. So um, I in briefly just introduced myself. Let me now introduce the panelists. And after I have done so, I'm going to ask each of them to speak for just three minutes about a perspective that they would like to share uh, with you and with the other panelists on this topic. After that, we'll get engaged in a bit of a conversation amongst the panel, which I will try to stimulate. And then after a bit, we will throw this open to you, the audience. So please be thinking about things that you would like to raise as far as questions uh, to this distinguished group. And somewhere near the end, I will try to have the panelists uh, give you some summary of what it was that was most important that they take away from the conversation we've had as part of this session. So uh, let me do the introductions, and very briefly, because you have materials about these folks in your packet. But starting uh, nearest to me, Olivier Brandecourt is the chief executive officer of Sanofi in France. He's a physician. Uh, he's been CEO since April of 2015. His specialty is in infectious diseases and tropical medicine, including focus on malaria research. He spent two years in Congo as a doctor before moving into pharmaceutical industry at Pfizer, at Bayer, and now at Sanofi. Uh, next uh, in the line here is uh, Edith Schippers, who's the Minister of Health, Welfare, and Sport of the Netherlands. Uh, she has been a member of the House of Representatives since 2003, when she was first elected. And she, her role is particularly important because, as you know, Netherlands has the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Uh, and uh, her role, therefore, since October 2010 as Minister of Health, Welfare, and Sport uh, is particularly relevant to our conversation today. Uh, next, uh, Paul Bulka. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Nestle here in Switzerland. He has a degree in commercial engineering. He's been with Nestle since 1979 and has been a CEO since 2008. Nestle, as you may know, is the world's largest nutrition, health, and wellness company. And um, no doubt he will have a lot to say about the nutritional aspects of health. Uh, next, uh, Franz van Houten, who is the chief executive officer and chairman of Royal Philips here in the Netherlands, uh, where he has been since 1986. Uh, he has also uh, played the role of improving uh, their, their view in health. Uh, Philips, as you may know, is an electronics company, but now very much a health company. And it has a stated goal of improving 3 billion lives per year by 2025. 
And finally, on the end, uh, Riza Lavizo Mori, who is the Chief Executive Officer and President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She's a physician uh, with specialty in geriatrics, and also has an MBA. Uh, she has been President and CEO of RWJ since 2003. RWJ is a private foundation working to build a culture of health. So those are the introductions. I thought we might, in the order that makes some sort of plausible sense, although this could be a little bit random, uh, I might start with Riza uh, to say from your perspective as the head of a foundation that looks at this whole question of health and a culture of health, what would you like to share with this group? Uh, first of all, I, I think we need to acknowledge why health is so important. Uh, as has been raised many times at this conference, health is really essential to having a healthy, resilient economy and population. So we start there. And then uh, at our foundation, we like to say that uh, health really exists where we live, learn, work, and play. And so in order to achieve health, we have to think more broadly than the healthcare system or disease states and uh, acknowledge that where people live, whether they have access to open spaces, whether they have access to healthy food and opportunities to be physically active are as important or more important to being able to achieve uh, a healthy state and certainly a healthy population. So let me try to be a little bit provocative and uh, focus on what business leaders might do in order to um, increase the health of populations and, if you will, uh, do good and do well. So three quick examples. The first is Disney, uh, certainly a place where we like to go and play. And a few years ago, many of you may know that they voluntarily changed the uh, default on their kids' meals at, most of their theme, at all of their theme parks. So instead of getting uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, and French fries, you would get water, low-fat milk, uh, and vegetables as part of the meal. Uh, when they evaluated this a few years later, they found satisfaction among the parents was extremely high. Calories were reduced by 21%. Sodium was reduced. And it didn't have any impact on their ability to sell meals at the theme park. So where you play, changing the default can make a big difference in the ability for people to have access to healthy food. Uh, second example, many of you from uh, the U.S. know that CVS Health uh, in 2014 decided to stop selling tobacco products in all of their retail stores. At the time, they were worried that they were going to take a $2 billion hit to revenues. Uh, and what they found is they did take a, a hit to revenues, but their stock price went up. And a year and a half later, when they evaluated the impact of this decision, they found that in the states where they have more than 15% market share, the percentage of cigarettes sold went down. Average smoker uh, bought five less packs of cigarettes. And in fact, their uh, sales of nicotine replacement products went up. And then the third example, really quickly, is one that involves leaders from across the um, food chain who looked in uh, 2012 at whether or not they could take uh, empty calories, if you will, out of the food supply and committed to take 1.5 trillion calories out of the food supply. This was 16 companies ranging from PepsiCo to Coca-Cola um, uh, and General Mills, many others, Kraft. Uh, and after about a year and a half, they had taken 6.4 trillion calories out. So three examples of where corporate leadership, business leadership was able to restructure the ecosystem, if you will, so people were better able to make healthy choices. Great. Thanks a lot, Risa. Well, you just brought up nutrition, so let me turn to Paul Bolka at Nestle. Risa, we were also one of them. Yeah, I, I knew. I was, as soon as I started naming but, names, I was going to get in but, trouble. But, but I'm sure you didn't mention so that I could mention. There you go. <laughs> um, so gracious. Now, only a few thoughts, maybe not interlinked, but uh, uh, first of all, I must say, that's now for a few years that we here in, in, in Davos speak about, about health, and, and that actually uh, uh, also nutrition is part of that uh, discussion. We have also the governor's meetings where we have the healthcare sector, yes. and, 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 and I remember the first time Nestle was sitting on the table, everybody was saying, what are they doing here? <laughs> and, and, but if you think uh, nutrition, and actually the Chinese, they, and, and I have said that before, the Chinese, they say it very well, the best medicine is food. Uh, they see 
um, uh, uh, when we speak about healthcare, normally we wear, and that has changed. We were talking about sick care, and 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 now, you, and you mentioned that before. Let's talk about inducive health, not therapeutic health, mm -hmm. and and health is actually health is not a disease, mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, you have you have to really as a society to look in how can we keep and the business case, if you want, the economical value, but also the the wellness value of a healthy society is tremendous. Um, how can we keep health? And, and actually, by going about that equation, nutrition starts to be very pretty much part of that equation. Because uh, good nutrition uh, versus malnutrition or over uh, calories or etc. is tremendously uh, uh, linked with a healthy society. And there, uh, everybody has to play its part, but starts be that awareness. Also that the population understands the importance of nutrition in its own life, that we educate people so that they can make a health, the healthy choices, the healthy lifestyle choices, that companies like ours take their responsibility too and deliver nutrition in the right way. And there we have made uh, major strides, there's more to be done. So the responsibility, but first of all, understanding the relationship between good nutrition and health and how actually good nutrition can be inducive and induce health, create health, and keep health over time. That's, that's one. Then the complementarity of the healthcare or the sick care systems with nutrition. Uh, a treatment when you have to recover from uh, um, an, an intervention or something, how health can actually accelerate or secure uh, medical interventions is also to, to be explored. Actually, there's not a lot of that happening yet. Just an example, if we can through adapted nutrition who, for somebody who has got an intervention, uh, or shorten his stay in hospital. That is a tremendous, um, I would say, uh, positive push into lower healthcare costs. The healthcare costs in the world are uh, going through the roof. We know that, specifically in the Western world, in North America, closing into 20%. The healthcare systems are being built up in the, in the developing world. 75% of the world population is building health or thinking together with the, health, uh, with the middle class building up, uh, think about healthcare systems. They're never going to be able to afford the systems we have. So what is the answer there? And we should explore uh, together these, uh, these dimensions. So I would say also, health is local. We can speak globally, but at the end of the day, we speak about nutrition, then you start to localize dramatically um, um, health and health status. Each country has another uh, challenge to, uh, to answer. So we can speak globally, but at the end of the day, and you mentioned that only the healthcare system has 20% of that equation, 80% is more or less local. And their nutrition is definitely a very, very important factor. So these are a few thoughts. Great, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, let me turn next to Olivier uh, Brandecourt to talk about some of the technologies and other interventions that are coming out of uh, pharmaceutical companies that might play a role here in prevention. Thank you, Colin. So the... Um the task is very clear, right? We have to uh, provide health care and health security to 10 billion people. And I like to be a little bit blue sky and talk about 20, 30, or 20, even 50 here. Uh, it's going to be a humongous task and require a lot of coordination between multiple stakeholders, of course. Uh, the cost of it, we wouldn't be able to afford if we were using the same system as today. So what could be the system which will allow us to get there? It has to be based, and it's a concept uh, which uh, has been uh, uh, emerging at the NIH just before Dr. Collins several years ago by Elias Zeruni of the four Ps. So the medicine of the future, in order to allow us to use a preventive medicine in order to prevent cost, has to be preventive. It has to be participatory. It has to be personalized. And it has to be predictive. And if you put the four together, you eventually can get there, if we're lucky. So let me talk about the first, uh, the first two Ps where our industry can participate. Predictive is based on a huge level of data. Um, and of course, the computational you know, technology uh, to analyze it and come up with predictive models. 
where is the data coming from? It's going probably to come from uh, very similarly to we had with the Framingham study, uh, ongoing prospective study where patients would be um, very well um, known and uh, whose genetic material would, or genetic map would be very well understood as it would be connected with a lot of different clips, and we would know exactly you know, what they are doing in terms of activities all day long. And by assembling that material, you can eventually predict, based on that genetic material, um, what would be the risk. Therefore, risk drives uh, potential prevention. Now, in terms of the second P, which has to do with prevention, that's where our industry can collaborate and uh, come up with, uh, with new technology. So the immune system is the best tool for prevention. We know that for a long time. And we are using it today very effectively for infectious diseases uh, in the developed world and now more and more in the de developing world. And that has helped us to tackle very significant uh, infections. Um, we can go one step further and get to, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years with universal, you know, flu vaccine, for instance. We just put out at Sanofi the dengue fever vaccine, and maybe in 2050, uh, you know, dengue fever would be eradicated um, from the surface of the earth, and that would be great. Um, but we can think about vaccine one step further again, looking at uh, NDCs um, and um, especially because they represent such a very heavy uh, burden on the cost of healthcare. I think diabetes plus cardiovascular plus Alzheimer's represent about 75% of the entire cost of the uh, uh, developed country health systems. It is possible to imagine that in 2050, we would have a vaccine against Alzheimer's. Um, we tested one, not we, but the industry has. And um, you know, we got into serious side effects. But today, you can send antibodies across the blood-brain barrier, connect to what is responsible for Alzheimer's, this beta amyloid protein, and you can extract that and get your brain rid of that protein. So by doing exactly the opposite and injecting fragment of that protein, you can eventually elicit antibodies which would do the job. So that's one example of a potential situation in 30 uh, or 35 years from now. Um, then you get into a different type of prevention beyond vaccine. It's a prevention of um, diseases which are driven by multiple genes. They are way too complex to be related only to a couple of genes. And diabetes, for instance, type 2 diabetes is one of those examples. It's triggered by, we think, about 200 genes. So what type of prevention do we have there? Very different. It can't be vaccine. It would have to be uh, you know, education. Um, it would have to be connected devices. and. Um, so that's what I wanted to put on the table. Uh, prevention is a solution as long as we have very good predictive model. And you can imagine a world in 2050 where we would have tackled very serious diseases. Great. Thanks very much. Talking about technology, let me turn to Franz Van Houten from Philips. Thank you. Um, well, it's then maybe our job to make that uh, futuristic world of Olivier happen. Um, uh, a lot at, at Davos is being talked about about population health, you know, and how do we change and improve the, the, the health of a population. Uh, and then people talk about analytics and data. That's all right and that's all important and necessary because we, you can identify cohorts of people that need a certain approach and treatment. But what we should not overlook is that we actually need to reach these people, right? Because they will only get better if we touch their lives and somehow make their lives better. Um, and we talk about the consumerization of health, and this is where people take accountability for their health. Uh, the, sh the sheer fact that we need to say that already me means that it is not easy to, to influence people's health and lifestyle and uh, accountability. Um, and 
you know, you come to a very complex system where you need to think about the incentives and disincentives that drive behavior, education, um, know-how, um, systems that work against each other, right? I mean, uh, let's face it, the payer system and the healthcare providers, they are not all collaborating in the same way. Um, and it is a passive system versus a proactive system. Um, I mean, we wait until somebody gets sick until we and then we cure them rather than reaching out in a preventative way. So I, I think this is more the territory of the Ministry of Health, of course, but I think we all need to realize that there are environmental conditions to be, to be influenced before we can uh, get major breakthroughs on uh, healthy lifestyles. Now, technology will certainly play a role in this, and uh, we are dedicated, dedicating Philips to be a health tech company to, to do this, uh, both in the world of health care, professional health care, and in the world of consumer health. And we would like not to oppose these worlds, but we'd like to bridge them. We think we need to get an integration of these worlds where the healthcare professional becomes the healthcare coach, proactive, and the consumer actually takes accountability for their own health. Um, enabling consumers uh, uh, to measure and then to monitor and manage their health uh, and where we also motivate them on their health is, is a world that is entirely possible. And technology is available. Uh, we have the sensor technology um, that people can wear on their bodies. We can measure full continuously. In the cloud, we can do algorithms to uh, provide feedback. Um, and if we would couple that to uh, education and incentive systems, I'm sure we can have a major impact. It will require money streams to be perhaps redirected to facilitate some of these preventative care programs to be financed because um, what stands in the way of adoption is partly also, also money. Uh, we don't want to wait for all of that. Uh, every small step is one. Um, and at Philips we said, okay, if people like their their fries, maybe we can do deep frying without fat. Small step for mankind, but still a major leap, right? <laughs> so um, if we get kids to, to brush their teeth well, uh, dental hygiene is, is very important and will have major consequences down the road for one's health. Right? So we, we have used gamification technology to help kids brush their teeth well. And now it becomes fun to brush your teeth. Right, that's good. So I'm, I'm sure that, let's say, the, using technologies like gamification and, and online data and feedback mechanisms will start to uh, influence people. I do want to warn against the world of gadgetry uh, because I think it will need to be based on real clinical insights uh, and proof. Um, and consumers need to know that what they do will have an impact and can be trusted. Um, so gimmicky stuff that doesn't work actually sets us back. Right? So uh, I'm all in favor of applying some rigor and regulation around what we do in providing uh, health coaching, uh, but I, I am very hopeful of what uh, can come out of it. Um, and I, as I said in the beginning, I see the health professionals to be the health coach uh, in a connected world, um, in an online world. I'm sure we can support much greater populations uh, than today where people have to take an appointment, go to the doctor's office. Uh, um, but then, and maybe this is also to the minister, can we then also change the reimbursement rules where patients do not have to go to the doctor's physician's office um, because otherwise the doctor doesn't get reimbursed. So to foster innovation in the world of health, uh, I think we need to take the disincentives away take some of the rules, the old rules away and, and, and start pushing in the right direction. I think it's going to be fascinating. It doesn't have to take 30 years. Great. Thank you. So, Minister of Health, Welfare and Sport, many people seem to be pointing to you like, what can we do here <laughs> as terms of government policies to enhance a good outcome? I'm not a minister of education. I think education <laughs> is very important in this field. But I'm a minister of health, so for the healthcare system, a minister of sport for exercising and sport, and I'm responsible for healthy food and food safety. So I think a lot of uh, things come together that are really important. Because uh, if you're a minister of sport, exercise is 
in incredible uh, important for a healthy lifestyle. Not only to exercise in sports, but also how do you design your building? Is the stairs in the middle or is the elevator in the middle? Uh, we have in our office now desk bikes, so we don't sit all day on our chair, but we can also exercise a little bit behind our desk. We have meetings where we stand. Uh, we have in Holland, of course, as a cycling country, we have a cycling paths. That's very important because exercise is not that one hour or half an hour a day, maybe a week. It's much more. It's to exercise through the day. So I think this is the first major point. Secondly, of course, food is a major point. And if you say uh, food is the best medicine, that, be, that gives a, a, a big responsibility that we make healthy foods the healthy, uh, the easy choice. And um, in this uh, presidency of the EU, we organize um, a conference where we uh, try to find a roadmap to action how to, re, uh, how to reformulate our food. Because our food, if I want to, if I want to live healthy and I choose my food from the uh, supermarket, I eat too much salt, too much saturated fat, and um, maybe even too much calories. Mm. So, but if, to, if you want to lower this salt and you really want to keep the taste, so it can't be done in one year. But we can make a program, mm. how to make your food healthier. And there we need really the industry, restaurants, catering, and the supermarkets. So in Holland, we work together at a round table and we make a whole roadmap for Holland, but we are one part of a big internal market. So I really have an aim to make this roadmap for uh, Europe. Um, thirdly, I think these new technologies will have a big impact on whole healthcare, but especially also on the uh, prevention part. Because you see that um, all this education and all this healthy lifestyle, you see that there is a big gap between high, highly educated people and low educated people. In Holland, the gap of life expectancy is six years. And we're not, we don't have the biggest gap in the world. But six years already. How to uh, make uh, uh, um, uh, the easy choice, the healthy life uh, uh, more attractive? Uh, how to make it more understandable. And there we have these new technologies who can help brushing your teeth or uh, um, uh, gaming. Uh, I saw all kinds of gaming new uh, uh, situations where you really can um, uh, help people to exercise or even exercise with dementia in an institute mm -hmm. with gaming. And this is really, there's a whole world we can explore uh, so I think um, this new technology will help also in this prevention uh, for so far. And uh, e-health is in reimbursement in the Netherlands. You, can, uh, you don't have to have a face-to-face -face contact. You can also get your e-health reimbursed, by the way. <laughs> by the way, well, very good. <laughs> ah, wonderful comments from all five of you. Um, I guess uh, just to pick up on a number of the things that were put forward, it doesn't seem as if we have a lack of ideas about ways to influence uh, healthy behaviors, whether they're behavioral modifications or whether they're structural changes in the environment or biomedical interventions or policy changes. But it doesn't always seem that we have the strongest evidence uh, to know which of those are actually working. Uh, and uh, good intentions, of course, uh, sometimes aren't sufficient to result in good outcomes, and the plural of anecdotes is still not data. Uh, and we've certainly seen circumstances where things that made a lot of sense uh, ultimately didn't turn out to provide uh, improved outcomes. And so what we really ought to insist on, I would think, whether it's uh, testing out the latest wearable sensor, and I'm wearing a couple of them because I wanted to see if they agreed and they don't, which tells me that somebody's not right here. Uh, <laughs> We really ought to have a system for generating that kind of evidence in real world and to figure out then how to implement the things that work and maybe not the things that don't. And of course, payers are very interested in that kind of evidence as well they should be. Uh, Olivier, you mentioned uh, sort of the importance of prospective studies where you might have the chance uh, to do some of that evidence collection. Can, can you say a little bit more about how we might be doing a better job of that, even as we are 
having all these great aspirations, but maybe we aren't exactly sure whether we're on the right path or not. Well, again, it's not going to be only prospective, ongoing study with healthy subjects. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I'm saying that, I'm referring to you know a study which is well known in in the industry, which is called Baseline, where we for 10 years, uh, you know, segment of uh, uh, 10,000 people will be uh, um, you know followed, and um, because they would have started healthy, you would be able to detect um, you know, the emergence of pathology mm -hmm. during those 10 years. And therefore, the predictive model would become very, very uh, granular. But the data would come from electronic medical records, from many, many, uh, of course, databases. So bottom line is we need to get down to very precise um, predictive model, which each individual would basically own with his or her healthcare um, you know, professional and would drive behaviors, including you know, uh, eating healthy and uh, exercising and many different things. But, but um, sometimes being fully aware that the risk of a much serious disease is actually in the genetic map. And, and make sure that you have the appropriate behavior and intervention in order to avoid a very big cost to the system later on. Sure. Um, and just one, one example to, to, to finish that is, uh, has to do with diabetes, right? We're not very successful in educating diabetes patients and uh, we try for decades and 50% of the diabetic population type two is still not at goal. So how do you deal with that? Of course, you reinforce the education and uh, the healthy behaviors. But at the same time, technology can help you um, to control absolutely perfectly the, uh, the uh, glucose level of those patients. Uh, and uh, I, I see some uh, people from Novartis in the audience, right? You can have lens measuring your <coughs> glucose level. You need to have two, of course, because of the, otherwise the FDA, FDA will not allow the pump to eventually inject. You need, you know, two measures. But uh, you could have a complete um, control 24-7 uh, of your glycemia through uh, technology today or if it's not today, it's in, you know, tomorrow or 10 years from now. So that's a very good example where technology can actually drive costs down yes. uh, significantly. And your point's well taken that we should be careful not to assume that the strategy that works for one person as far as improving their health outcomes is necessarily going to work for another. We all have different approaches, and this personalizing of the enterprise is probably critical if we're going to see maximum benefit. What about mental health? We haven't said a whole lot about that. Uh, I don't know if any of you would like to weigh in. What, with given the enormous weight uh, that mental health uh, carries in terms of uh, human experience on the individuals, on families, in terms of uh, economic costs, um, are, are there places there uh, that we haven't explored sufficiently that we ought to be paying more attention to? I don't know, Risa, if you want to weigh in from RWJ's perspective. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think uh, it's such a big topic and obviously one that uh, carries a tremendous burden. But one of the areas that I think uh, we haven't looked at enough and bears more investigation is, is the role that toxic stress uh, plays in uh, leading to mental uh, illness and problems, particularly in low-resource communities, but increasingly around the world where we have people that are living with daily trauma, uh, they're living uh, in situations where they have violence as a regular part of their lives. So I guess my, my point is that at the same time we're looking at the treatment of uh, behavioral health and mental health issues, we've also got to focus some resources on those early uh, causes that we, uh, we don't study enough in order to understand the impact that they're going to have 10 or 15 years from now. And certainly we are not designing the care that we provide with a lens of how to make sure that those people that are um, in regular traumatic situations are getting the, the care that they need. 
Let me ask about sustainability of these kinds of interventions, because I think that's a big concern for people who have tried to impose uh, or, or introduce uh, various means of, of encouraging healthy behaviors. Uh, I understand that the number of people who actually, once they've acquired a wearable sensor, wear it for more than a week or two is a minority, and most sort of get bored with it quickly. Uh, Franz, from your perspective, where you have a big investment in this space, what do we need to do uh, to sort of face up to that issue that it's not just a short term we're looking at, we're trying to look at long term, and we need to obviously start as early as possible yeah. to change health behaviors well, but before it's too late. You recall that I met, made the distinction between gadgets and, yes. uh, um, you know, real uh, solutions. And, um, you know, when you measure, you also need to monitor. Uh, and you need to motivate. I uh, use the 3M model that we use at Philips. Um, the, the, the feedback loop back into a cloud environment uh, and where the incentive uh, or the payment and the reimbursement uh, is tied to the adherence uh, is important. I can give various examples. I mean, if you are uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea and you are on a, uh, a CPAP device, that costs money, and if your insurance reimburses that, then I think it is fair to say we also expect that the machine is being used properly. Now, many patients do that because it really helps them, right? but now we have created a connected CPAP machine where we, on a daily basis, measure the use, we measure uh, the oxygen saturation, we measure uh, heart rate, we measure sleep uh, uh, adherence, we give feedback the day after, here's what happened to you the last 24 hours, but we can also provide data back to the, to the provider or the insurance company, like, you know, this patient is, is no longer using it, or uh, therefore, in terms of accountability, uh, taking accountability of your own health, something has to happen, right? And I, I envisage these kind of Solutions. Now, you may say, well, that's Big Brother watching you. No, I mean, you get a service, you, you sign up for a service, and the adherence to the service is part of it. Uh, so I think that's a, a kind of a world where we need to go to. Um, and I, uh, I see most patients opt into that because they get a better service. Right? And, and they are not there to uh, they actually see the benefit. So there's a bit of a stick, but there's also a carrot. Paul. Um, you said that this... Um, uh, people taking care of themselves, having these monitoring uh, devices, they have them for two weeks and all, is linked with some, something fundamental, that is uh, health at the end of the day. What is the value of health, perceived value of health? And all, you, have, you, you, you value it really when you lose it. But as long as you have it, you feel everything is okay. And, and that's so, it's something fundamental. And I think when we say also, the self-responsibility of the individual towards his health is something that I feel in society has to be increased dramatically. And it goes even beyond health. It goes the self-responsibility in society has to be increased. That's basic education to a certain extent too. And, and I think somewhere in society we, and that's philosophy now, but somewhere in society we have uh, to, yeah, the government is going to care for you. Yeah, yeah, but the first thing is you care for yourself, and that is an obligation. And we should, as a society, to drive that more and stronger. And 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 that is linked with fundamental, uh, as I said, education, and that starts very young. And and that sounds like very um, idyllic, <coughs> but that is fundamental. And also in nutrition, healthy diets. It's true that that uh, we have to do our part, and and we have to deliver. Uh, 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 food satisfaction because people like to eat and 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 they like food and but we have to do it and and build science and R and D that we are investing quite heavily also in our company is to to give that and uh, calories out and and salt and all that and we're doing major strides we we have to see and and bring that further but that's not going to compensate for unhealthy lifestyles for unhealthy diets uh, and so uh, and there we, that has to be complementary. And I think it's fundamental. It's, it's, it's a fundamental question, not only for health, for other reasons too, for other dimensions in society too. Self-responsibility as an individual in society. And we should, as a society, actually force that, saying you have to be responsible for yourself first, in the first place. And so my governments has a role to play there too, because sometimes you feel governments or politicians, they want to they wanna protect. You say, don't think I'm going to do it for you, you see? Uh, which are things like labelings and all that. Uh, you cannot tax yourself to glory. Um, 
you have to install a little bit more fundamental uh, responsibility in society. So points taken that uh, individual responsibility is necessary, but is it sufficient? I think evidence would say it no. often is not. No. And, and let me ask M Minister uh, Shippers, in terms of tobacco, we have not talked about tobacco yet, and we need to as the most significant <coughs> cause uh, of premature death and morbidity that ought to be preventable, and yet we are still uh, far from having succeeded in that battle. It, obviously, a rational actor presented with the evidence about the harm of tobacco would never start smoking, and if they did, would stop immediately, but we know that that has not worked, uh, despite sharing the information. So uh, various other entities obviously can be called upon to help, but governments uh, are one of them. Fr from your perspective, what more should we be doing about this very preventable cause uh, of millions and millions of deaths? I think this is a very a difficult topic because yes. in the end people decide themselves that they eat unhealthy, they drink too much, or they smoke. And as a government you can make laws, you don't smoke in public uh, buildings, but you can smoke at home, you can smoke. Uh, uh, so in the end I think education is really important and uh, I can't underline that enough. How about taxing? But it's not enough. And taxes? <coughs> of course, it's, it's heavily taxed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the taxes are already uh, quite uh, heavy. You can always try to uh, do more, but then you get also illegal um, uh, import. Mm -hmm. So you see that we hired the, the age of, uh, on which you can drink alcohol in uh, the Netherlands. We, we made it from 16 to 18. Uh, but we see that you get uh, people, uh, young people, not to drink uh, anymore in cafes because it's illegal, but they smoke uh, marijuana or uh, they use ecstasy. So you see, but if you look closely, you see that in people themselves decide to be healthy or not. I can't understand that people take these ecstasy pills. It's a blue pill. You have no idea what's in it. And we have incidents. <coughs> Uh, on a regular basis, but still they take the pills. So it's very tough to have a healthy lifestyle, to promote it. Of course, you, you can have taxes, you can make your food healthier, you can make the healthy choice easier, to exercise easier, to have a safe environment, a healthy environment, but still, I don't know what it is with people, but they always want to... <laughs> well, we're talking about all of ourselves here. <laughs> You know, in an ideas lab yesterday, uh, we talked about addictions and how one of the most really diabolical aspect of addiction is that it takes this opportunity of being a rational actor and completely erases it. Yeah. And so to expect somebody to just will themselves out of that kind of behavior flies in the face of everything we're learning about brain neurochemistry. So you have to prevent them from starting. Exactly. Because when they already started, it's very tough to stop. Indeed, and you can't just sort of count on the individual to be able to do that without some help. I'm going to open this up now to questions from the audience. I assume there are roving microphones around here somewhere. If you have a question, uh, identify yourself, uh, please, and if you want to pose it to one member of the panel, uh, say so. Otherwise, we'll figure out who's best positioned uh, to, to weigh in. Questions, right here. Thank you. My name is Khalid Falah, Minister of Health, Saudi Arabia. And my question to uh, Mr. Brandicourt, Olivier, is about the speed of development of new technologies and especially new pharmaceutical products. I mean, I got excited hearing about immunization against uh, some of these diseases, but then you say 2050. We see this acceleration of new product development in other, tech, you know, in other areas like IT, what is it in, uh, in pharma and healthcare in general that is making it a slower, although the solutions may be identified, the time to market is so long? What can be done about it? Yeah, so, so um, the 2050 I used is because I'm next to, you know, the head of the NIH, so I didn't want to say anything which would be scientifically completely crazy. But I, <laughs> I just... Go ahead, I, it's all right. <laughs> I just wanted to be a little bit blue sky and, you know, uh, kind of paint a, a, a world, uh, the world of 2050 and how we can, you know, tackle some of those very 
uh, heavy uh, diseases I was describing. Um, the length of development has um, not 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 be prolonged recently, including with those new technologies. We we just put a very targeted technology on the market for cardiovascular diseases, right? Uh, PCSK9 technology. Uh, the first revolution were, were the statins. They completely change the way we are. Um, doing cardiovascular medicine. I think that new technology is so targeted, bringing the you know, bad cholesterol so low now to such a level that they are approximately the levels you are born with, right? And families with that level, genetically, because you have mutation of their genes, um, they're dying, of course, but they're never dying of any cardiovascular uh, incident. So, um, so that we develop that molecule in a matter of um, you know a few years, uh, uh, probably uh, seven, eight years. Uh, so that has not been extended. Uh, however, you can always think that it would have to be accelerated. And frankly, the answer is def is in the hands of the regulatory agencies, right? Because they are dictating the rules. Question. I think I see one back here. Two more coming. Norbert Rüdenschmidt from Bain. And we have been working with the World Economic Forum on this topic of health. And I just want to highlight one other point, you know, which I think is important in terms of the urgency of getting something moving. Uh, we have looked at the data, and if we do, don't do nothing in terms of the non communicable diseases, things are going to turn really sick very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we were just to wait till 20, Nine, you know, we actually would face, I would say, a tsunami, which is as important from a financial perspective as five times the financial crisis. So the question actually would be, you know, how do we get movement going? And how do we address the urgency that's there based on the tsunami of non communicable diseases which are coming? And perhaps that's something, Lisa, to you, or also Paul, to you in terms of consumerization and how do we make health, I would say, sexy in a positive sense? Well, I think one of the key issues is that we, we can't take this on sort of uh, one silo at a time. Right. It uh, really is going to take a systems approach, starting with developing a shared value for what we mean about health and having that be much broader than, uh, as was referenced earlier, sickness care. Secondly, I think, uh, and it's been mentioned here, Health really happens in the context of communities. And so having a community-based approach, whether it's a state, a county, uh, a, 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 a larger region, is going to be critical. And uh, we've talked a lot about integration of the various systems of care, whether it's data that is used to do that integration or you know, old-fashioned ways of, of creating greater communication and coordination, particularly uh, for people as they get older and have more than one non-communicable disease. And then finally, leadership. So I think in, unless we really look at it from a comprehensive approach, it's unlikely that we're going to solve the problem uh, with the urgency that we have to. Franz, um, I agree with all of that. I would add one thing. You're still talking about consumers. And consumers need to be addressed uh, in a compelling way. Uh, so rules uh, are not necessarily helping, but uh, marketing can. Right? So I've, I mentioned gamification, but we should also mention role modeling, uh, and especially in the communities. Um, now, that costs money. I mean, of course, as business, we will do it uh, as part of our value propositions. But to, to get a society to evaluate health in a different way, I would advocate for a change program, and a change program that includes the role of the communities and, and role models, and so on, and so on. Uh, and that will cost money. Right? And uh, I, I don't totally agree with the 20-80% rule because it is difficult to grab the 80. But the 20% is a big bill. Right? It's trillions. And um, I applaud the, the US government for experimenting with the redirecting some money, for example, under the DISRIP program, to, to, to get health care professionals to engage in preventative care programs in the community. Now, that's all uh, trial and error and learning, fine. Uh, but I, I do think we need to start these programs uh, and find out what works and find out what doesn't work and then scale them up. Um, I think we could step up the, the, the financing of, of some of these programs a bit more 
uh, because otherwise it's talk only and, and we don't get enough action. Paul, you want to? Yeah, very fast. Um, because we always speak about health like there's only uh, one dimension in society. There's so many different uh, societies and countries and situations and, and uh, non-communicable diseases are actually exploding in societies where, where there is malnutrition. Uh, and so what can we do there? And actually there's quite a lot of things happening already. Um, I speak for what I know, but uh, the micro-fortification um, in these countries, and we know the mappings, there is so much to be done. We, we for example, can use the products that we already sell uh, or have present in these markets and fortify them. We do that by the rate, uh, ratio of 200 billion portions in the last year only for my company. But then we are also part of a industry, and we are influencing and doing that in the industry too. And Consumer Goods Forum is one of them where we have one pillar, only four pillars we have. One pillar is health, and how we as an industry, together with retail, can bring that. And I think these impacts are dramatic. Um, you see, we can map that then also the results. And you see also, um, sometimes say, no, you should first measure the impact. You do what is obvious first, and then you see after, uh, over time. And there you touch lots of lives. You touch lots of, lots of lives, and, and, that, that, and very positive. Education also. Um, education, we speak about self-responsibility, and we know, and, um, but uh, we, we have programs with children about nutrition in, in rural areas, and we're touching, uh, my company alone has touched over the last years 10 million p uh, children already. Children are motivators of adults. They go home, uh, and look, the, and it's gonna be, Hard work, and, and, and what we have to do is consistency over time. You have to hammer. That's education. Everybody who has children know what I mean. But, yeah, <laughs> uh, but you have to go on and on and on. And, 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 and you have to use, you see also what we do in many of these countries. We go with projects and then we leave. You have to make sure that you stay. And, and, and companies like mine, can, we are there for more than 100 years already. So we use that consistency in time. So uh, the Western world, uh, the developed world is one thing. There's so much that you can dramatically change in the developing world also. And that's, that's where we're looking at too. So um, just uh, uh, that note. Um. Thanks, question here. Yes. Kamen Ukbo, Garen Cardiac Institute. Uh, Dr. Braden Cardiac and perhaps uh, Paul Bok uh, with his uh, inclination for philosophical vision. Um, which are the two, three most important delayed decisions, public decisions in the present day world. I don't ask Madame Minister because I want she to hear this. And as we call it, as they call it in the in the industry of, of insurance and reinsurance industry, what's the price of the decisions untaken, so so to say, or decision delayed in the public agenda? Well um, I, I, I can give you an answer for um, for diabetes, for instance, which is a big, big burden, right? And in the US, more than anywhere else, um, I think the overall annual bill is about 100 billion, right? Um, not doing the uh, educational piece, um, not integrated, right? The best algorithm in terms of distribution of uh, drug and insulin and uh, cost on average, um, 20, 20 billion. So right there, we think that you know for such a very specific epidemics, uh, intervention, relatively simple, not not waiting for the integrated health of the 2030 or 2050 would save uh, 20 billion. So, and 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 a big piece is due to behaviors and. Uh, uh, which are not responding to education. So my question to the minister is, uh, are we eventually considering policies, especially in countries where you have you know, universal coverage, which would penalize, fine, people who don't have the appropriate behaviors? Yeah. Because they are so costly to the overall system. But of course, that triggers a second question, which is, what type of policy are you putting behind uh, healthcare data privacy. And the two have to go together, but um, I think they are fundamental. If we wanted to tackle the huge you know, healthcare cost, we would have to be much more directive with patients, yeah. 
and healthy pay and healthy individuals. Sure. But Minister. I'm not sure policy side would automatically follow. Uh, let's I hear what the before the minister reacts. So, uh, oh. I think we need to look at the money streams. Uh, this is an area that's very difficult to tackle in most countries. Most money goes to curative care, volume driven, not outcome based. Right. So in the end, some money will need to be made available for preventative care programs, uh, outcome based. So nobody says that we should get money for for just an effort. You know? Should be results oriented. As a public policy. Now, let's experiment with that, but let's make a move. So can I, I know I wasn't asked, but can I uh, weigh in? Everybody wants this one. Just, I think uh, investing in early childhood, in not only uh, the health of children, uh, zero to five years, uh, but also their social emotional learning and uh, their education. I think that there's good data that suggests that the return on investment across both health, education, and overall productivity uh, at age 25, the return on investment is somewhere one to seven. So um, to add to what we might put our resources in where uh, there's been a delay in action. Right. May, 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 I think we, we should let the minister respond oh. to the <laughs> query that was posed. <laughs> Please. If you look at healthcare systems like in the Netherlands, you see that everybody pays according to their income. And you see that lifestyle and bad eating is uh, a lower income, has higher, um, uh, they, they eat worse, they uh, uh, have a, a worse life, lifestyle. There's a lot of impro improvement possible. If I will make penalties for this group, they already don't pay for their own insurance. They, can, they are subsidized. So we have to subsidize them more to pay their penalty. I don't think this is the way. I think the way is much, is, is very difficult. Because why is it so difficult? We have several programs in Holland that are quite successful. But they take a lot of energy. You have to be with a long breath. You have to uh, take uh, the children and their mothers, and by their mothers, the whole family, to educate education programs about food, but also to exercise. And these programs are quite successful. You see that obesity is lowering in these neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods. So it's very successful. But we have to stay there. And you know that when you have elections in the next government, and they say we have a whole different, different program. So, and it takes a lot of energy because it's much more easy to make a program on paper and put it in the, uh, uh, in the paper box of, of, a, of a house. And you say, okay, well, I've done my work. To have them, at a, at a, um, um, at a, to take a whole community in a different lifestyle is possible, but it costs a lot of energy. I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to have a lightning round of summaries. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Collins. Um, you asked the question. You want to on, say who you oh, are? Oh, sorry. Stan Bergman. I'm the CEO of Henry Schein. We're the largest provider of dental, medical, and vet products to office-based practitioners. Um, you asked about mental health. You mentioned tobacco. And I was just wondering if the panel, and I think probably everyone on this panel may have an opinion, on oral care. Uh, there are 3.1 billion people in the world that suffer from caries. And if there is a way to reduce caries, I think in the end it would improve health in general. There are many studies that have been published specifically in the last five or six years directing the correlation between oral care and health care in general. So I think practically everyone on the panel would in one way have an answer because I think most people on this panel are involved in one way or another in the oral care arena. Responses? Well, I, I violently agree. <laughs> uh, to, uh, and I think actually oral care has come a long way, right? I mean, uh, we can be still negative that there are all these people that have carriers, but uh, it, it is an environment where uh, by collaboration between health professionals and education, uh, uh, we have come uh, quite far. So I think let's just continue now. And again, that's another example where in intervention of multiple components, including fluoride in the water, uh, has made a huge difference that wouldn't necessarily have happened just because we told kids to brush their teeth and they didn't necessarily. But maybe, this. Minister, there's also a social divide on oral hygiene. Mm -hmm. Is there? Um, I think there is, yes. Yeah. 
uh, we have for children, it's in our universal coverage. Mm -hmm. But uh, although you can go for free to a dentist, you see that certain groups don't go with their yeah. children. Yeah. So that's not only a financial question, it's also, is it in your culture, is it in your system to go every year? Yes. And education, you, we come still <laughs> come back at education, yes. So we have only an hour, unfortunately, to discuss a topic that could occupy uh, many days and has, many weeks, many years, uh, but it's been, I think, very useful having the chance to hear from all of you. Let me just quickly ask, before we break up, that each of you give me 30 seconds of sort of what do you think is the most important message that you would want this audience to hear from your perspective about how to shape the future of health. Uh, maybe we'll just go in order here, starting with you, Olivier. Well, I, I um, you know, I, I put forward the concept of the 4P in medicine for the future. And I think, interestingly, the most challenging is not data capture. It's not the pharma industry developing, you know, very sophisticated technology. It's, in fact, to change the behavior of people in order to drive that prevention, which will itself drive the reduction in cost. Minister. I think most important is to work together. Mm -hmm. You can pinpoint the industry doesn't do this and the government doesn't do that, but I think that you're most successful if you work together and you, everybody has a, keeps his own responsibility. Mm -hmm. But by working together, I think the outcome is much more than if you do it on your own. Well said. Paul. From my side, just reiterating what I said, that it's good to feel that nutrition starts to be much more explicitly part of the health equa equation, uh, and not only in normal day-by-day -day food, but also that, and we are working that, investing in how, how to know understand better how nutrients interact with the human body. Uh, that's new science, and you think about the microbiome and so on, So, um, and seeing that we start to have more, more of that, uh, it would say, um, acceptance uh, of that equation is a good thing to feel. Great. Franz. Well, we live in a digital age. Every, every consumer wears a computer that's called a mobile phone. Uh, and the ability to provide measurements and feedback and thereby influencing and confronting people with their own behavior, I think, is, is much more possible now than ever before. So let's use all that technology and confront people and help them change their lifestyle. And I think we can be a little bit optimistic then. Teresa. Uh, I think it's going to take us uh, recognizing that this is going to take a culture change and one where we recognize that individual responsibility is critical, but so is creating a, the kind of environment where we put health decisions uh, in with all the other critical decisions we make, and particularly for uh, people who don't see health as what they usually do, uh, like architects who design the buildings that can either be healthy or not. So I can think everybody can appreciate the multiple components of this discussion and the multiple actors that need to get together in an integrated way if we're going to actually solve what could be an enormous challenge, as was pointed out by a question, the tsunami that we are facing of non-communicable diseases, whether that's tobacco-related or physical inactivity-related or diet-related or uh, abusive substances like alcohol. We have a huge challenge in front of us. Where better uh, than at the World Economic Forum uh, to take that on? Uh, please join me in thanking a wonderful panel.